Good enough. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Huttertal Mennonite Church on this very windy Sunday morning. Fifth, uh, yeah, fifth Sunday of Lent, second day of spring. And also a welcome to those of you who uh, will be watching uh, virtually. Please listen as we bring you the call to worship. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with Israel. I will be their God, and they will be my people. God, teach us wisdom in our secret hearts. Put a new and right spirit within us. Restore to us the joy of salvation, and sustain in us a willing spirit. We trust you, God, to forgive our iniquities and remember our sin no more. There is a time for everything, and sometimes the hour is upon us. Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears, knowing that those who love their life will lose it. The hour has come. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. We call out to you as you call us to deeper growth. Please bow your heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, during this time of Lent, you call us to deeper growth, and you invite us into a time of reflection upon our relationship with you and also with others. As we begin this service, we ask you to draw near and be with us. Enable us to come to a better understanding of the common good of all creation that you have asked us to guard and deepen our appreciation for both human dignity and human limits. May everything we do here be for the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Deep calls to deep. We call to you from the depths of our hearts. We confess our resistance to being planted into your aching earth, into the way of your covenant. We confess our need for you to plant us the joy of your salvation, a willing spirit. Deep calls to deep. You call to us from the depth of your love. Calling us to deep growth. We come to you, God. Good morning. We're now in the time of our service for prayer, requests, as well as maybe announcements, joys. Um, please welcome my mother and father-in-law, Brenda and Roger. They are here with us for the weekend. Any other concerns, requests? If you will, please pray for um, me. I know you probably do already, and if you don't, that, that's not offensive to me. Um, our lives are very busy. But if you are praying for me, you can specifically pray for the Monday Thursday service as we plan it and figure out um, something that would be notable, um, something that makes us think a little more about this time in Jesus' life um, before the crucifixion and all of that. So, if no one else has anything else, I'd 
Let us pray. Rock of ages, let me hide myself in you. God, this wind reminds us how sometimes life tosses us around. How life pushes us in one direction or another as experiences mold and shape us, challenge us, stretch us, test us. God, help us to stand firm on you as our rock and our redeemer this morning and for the week ahead. We remember this morning all of those who are in retirement homes, nursing homes, assisted living, spaces that still are not open for people to come or necessarily to visit either. We pray for those who are experiencing loneliness today. Those who are feeling separation, alienation, anxiety, worry in the midst of this pandemic. We pray also for those who are experiencing frustration and impatience and anger because of all that has come of this. We pray, God, that you would fill us with your spirit and give us the fruits of your spirit as well. Love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. And finally, we thank you for the ways that you have moved in us already and the ways that we are approaching Palm Sunday, Maundy Thursday, and Easter Sunday as we celebrate again this spring your son overcoming the powers of evil and the powers of death. We thank you for that. It is in Jesus' name that we all pray. Amen. So now comes the time in our service. It's going to be a little different. Uh, children, if you would come forward, if you have a mask, please wear it. Um, we're going to have you sit kind of in the front here and really, um, oh wow, that got a lot louder. Sorry, Chad. Um, we'll have you sit in the front, but we're, there isn't a body here. You're actually going to watch Suzanne Kerner on the TV, um, but we thought it'd be easier for you to see if you came toward the front of the sanctuary. Um, and if you would like to sit here as well, that'd be fine too, keeping your own space. But uh, they recorded a video for our children's story this morning. And you know what? I think I will, because I don't know what's in it either. Hi, everybody. Wish that we could be uh, in church with you all, but we had to stay home for this week. So I thought we would just say hello from home. Uh, so... I love to garden. I am a gardener and um, in fact I just got some seeds not too long ago in the mail. There's all kinds of stuff here from Johnny Seeds and I got more from a different company and I just got some in the mail today that I haven't even opened so I'm really excited to look through that stuff and with the warmer weather it uh, feels uh, like I just want to really get out. And um, even Jada here likes to garden. She, uh, well, tell us about your project here. For a class at school, we planted herbs. Mm -hmm. So I have like thyme and cilantro and dill and better cilantro, mm -hmm. basil. Yeah, I see some basil there. Yeah, they're growing pretty nice, aren't they? Not my part. Yeah, it looks like the parsley didn't come yeah. up, did it? Yeah, well, that happens sometimes. Yeah, yeah. so um, I thought that maybe uh, we would plant some flowers today. I got these flowers at a wedding, and I uh, haven't had a chance to plant them, so just going to stick some here in the soil. What you got over there, Jada? This is my bunny. Your bunny, what's his name, her name? Pistachio. Pistachio. Hi, Pistachio. 
So I'm just gonna poke them in just so they get kind of under the soil. I'm just using a pencil and then make sure to just cover them up so they're underneath there. And let's see, I'm put that on top. And stick some rocks on there. What else do we got? Maybe some newspaper and a sponge. Maybe top it off with this. What are you doing? What am I doing? Well, I'm just covering it with some stuff and then I'm going to start watering it. That's not going to work. Why is that not going to work? Because you can't reach the soil. Oh. You have all this stuff covering the soil and the seeds. Oh, you know, I think you're right. Maybe I should take that stuff off. Oh, okay. All right, well, I'll take off the rag and the sponge and the, all the stuff and the rocks. The rocks are pretty, though. That's kind of nice. Yeah. Even the cardboard, should I take it off? Yeah. Okay. All right. And now water it? Yeah. Okay. We'll do it that way. Okay, so I'm just going to water. Yeah. There we go. Now I'm going to watch it. It's not growing. What's cool. wrong? It takes time. Oh, yeah, I guess you're right. I guess it did take quite a bit of time for some of these things to grow, didn't it? Yeah. Well, come to think of it, I think we can sometimes be like these seeds. Um, all these things, the cardboard and the rocks and, and um, things that I put on top of the soil. Well, it's kind of like when we hold on to anger and resentment and unforgiveness and other bad feelings, I think. And then that keeps us from growing into what God wants us to be. We are children of God, right, Jada? And I believe that he wants us to be more kind and more loving and show mercy to people. And, um, well, actually we don't sprout flowers like these will, but um, I think if we take care of them correctly, um, when we choose to be forgiving instead of unforgiving and when we um, kind of just let our anger go and don't hold on to it so tight and we focus more on loving people I think that we are going to grow more and more into what we are supposed to be For the scripture reading today, it's from Jeremiah chapter 31, starting uh, verse 27, and that's page 415 of your uh, pew Bible. <clears throat> Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and the seed of beast, and it shall come to pass that as I have watched over them to pluck up, to break down, to throw down, to destroy, and to afflict, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. In those days they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, 
and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from me, from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that the city shall be built for the Lord from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate. The surveyor's line shall again extend straight forward over the hill Garib, and then it shall turn south, turn toward Goath, and the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes, and all the fields as far as the brook Kidron, to the corner of the horse gate toward the east, shall be holy to the Lord. It shall not be plucked up or thrown down any more forever. Thank you, John and Monica. Huttertal Mennonite Church, good morning. And good morning also to all of you. Got to find that camera up there again. Um, who are worshiping with us from your homes this morning. We worship in limited forms, as I say every week, but we earnestly await a day when normalcy returns. The days are surely coming, says the Lord. How pertinent is such a phrase in our current time? The days are surely coming. Let us pray. God of growth and evolution and journeying faith, we welcome you here into our hearts, our minds, and even our bodies asking that you continue to transform us into who you created us to be in your good world, your universe. Give us your spirit and renewed energy to follow after you and listen well. For your voice, for your direction in these strange and unnerving times, plant your word and your way deep in our hearts and minds and empower us to share how we have grown and been changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Deep relationship, accompanied by deep commitment and deep wisdom, can lead then to deep healing. That's what we explored last week. We walked with the Israelites in the wilderness as they struggled to find healing in the midst of great anguish and suffering under the power of the serpent, the snake. But God made a way, calling the people to face their fears and their own arrogance, offering a pathway to life and hope on God's terms, not on the people's misguided or short-sighted worldviews. Only when they looked at the symbol of their deepest terror, 
the serpent. Only when they looked at the symbol of their deepest terror, the true cause of their physical suffering, were they able to find healing, which then began a process of growth and maturation that continued as they followed God as cloud and fire into the promised land. This morning, then, we explore deep growth, or what could be called maturation, evolution, maybe even learning. I think learning is a sign of growth. And we explore growth as a deep and true piece of our lives, as a continued part of our Lenten journey, because what is going on today in the midst of pandemic, in the midst of very strange circumstances, is that we know it's not right, that this isn't the way things should be. So we are entering this spring season tomorrow, March 22nd, or today, depending on which day you say, is, or even maybe the 20th. But in this time, the spring season is to begin, and we know that deep growth is an integral part of our rural community's life as we come to each new spring hopeful for another good crop season. Our livestock farming brothers and sisters started a similar process many months ago, of which the fruit has already started coming in the form of calves and lambs during this early spring season. Now, I'm probably showing a little bit of my ignorance of livestock farming, so correct me later, please. I welcome it. But I did want to name that part of our community here and around us. In faith and commitment, then, when the weather and soil temperatures are right, we will place a seed or many seeds in the soil, confident that the tiniest or most insignificant part has the potential, right, the potential all on its own to to grow into food for ourselves, for our animals, for our neighbors, for our world in some sense. Just all from this little seed like we saw in Suzanne's video, this tiny insignificant piece. So much potential. And so we look to God in this spring season asking for blessings on the acts of faith that we practice every year at this time, calling on God for deep growth. We know also that a plant that grows deep into the soil has a better chance of yielding an abundant harvest, just as a community that lives deeply and extends roots deep into its past can offer the same abundant harvest of hope and joy and wisdom and confidence for the future. A community like Huttertal, with deep roots. What we do not always want to admit, though, is that deep growth requires transformation, often resulting from the interactions of our previous four concepts, the previous four deep and true pieces of our lives. Transformation comes when we embrace relationship and commitment and wisdom and healing. The seed that is set two inches into the soil does not come out looking like it did when it was planted. No, it changes into something beautiful, into the potential that had been harbored inside of it. Deep growth is what God calls us to each and every day, a transformation that draws out my potential, your potential, each one of us in this moment. And that potential then is watered and nurtured by the Holy Spirit and nourished by the life of Jesus and the testimony of our neighbors, the encouragement of our friends who tell us their stories as we see God moving in the midst of us. God is not finished with any one of us. And God has not given up on any one of us. No matter how you might feel about yourself, no matter the messages you might be telling yourself, or maybe 
how much you want to hide your true self from God, from your neighbors. God has not given up on any one of us. And God knows you deeply, truly, and longs for you to grow into the potential that is inside of you. The growth may be difficult, requiring more than what we think we are capable of, but God's calling is clear. If you would have told me five years ago that I would be pastoring a church in South Dakota, I guarantee you, I would have said, I don't know that I'm capable of that. I don't know that that is what God is calling me to. But lo and behold, the potential, God knew what was there, what could grow and be nurtured by a community like Huddertal. So Suzanne Kerner is writing my biography for the newsletter, which is very strange. I don't feel like an important enough person to have a biography written about me already, especially with only 30 short years to talk about. And our conversations have left me with a mess of emotions, sometimes wondering if visiting those past memories, especially the most life-altering ones, is worth it, or if I just need to put the past behind me. How many of you have felt that way when you revisit those memories, those moments that have changed you so deeply? What I have found, though, is how God has inspired and challenged me to consider alternative ways of thinking, evolving ways of understanding, which have all led to renewed longings to know God more. They haven't left me thinking that I have arrived or that I know God finally, but they have said, wow, there is so much more to this God that is calling me. I am not the same that I was yesterday, nor am I the same as I was five, 10, or 15 years ago. I have grown in ways that I never would have expected. I am different than I was, thank God. As some of you may also testify to, I am different than I once was. Have you spent much time thinking about or reflecting on how you have changed over the years, how you might think or believe or act differently than you did 20, 30, 40, or 80 years ago? How has God spoken to you, inspired you, challenged you? How has God drawn out your created potential? Or how have you refused God, when he has tried, how have you said, whoa, no way, God, this is not something I'm doing right now. I don't need this. I've got plenty going on. How have God and other people planted seeds in the fertile soil of your being that have grown into life and hope and peace and love? How have you found yourself watering those seeds, allowing them to sprout and flower And maybe even bear fruit. And fruit that you may not have expected when that seed was initially planted. Or, if we look at the negative of that same idea, how have you allowed your neighbors or friends or our culture to plant seeds of hate or greed or jealousy or envy or materialism or prejudice or judgment? Have you seen or felt more of these kinds of fruit in this season than you have the fruit of God's Spirit, the fruit that comes to maturity, hopefully, in the community of people that we call the church, hopefully, in a community like Huddertal. What fruits are you noticing? So our text this morning comes from the prophet Jeremiah. A long, long time has passed since our last story in the wilderness. If you remember, the younger generation of Israelites was on their way to enter the promised land. They are on the brink of God's promises and bringing an end to their difficult, insufferable, maybe for some, journey through the wilderness 
Over the next several hundred years, Israel will conquer the promised land, govern with judges and prophets initially, and then turn to kings to unite the 12 tribes for security and sustainability. But with the kings, there comes taxation and conscription, forced labor and power mongering. Absolute power corrupts absolutely when we center all of it in one person, like a king. In our story this morning, the people again are on the brink of something life-altering and catastrophic, of which Jeremiah has been warning them. But the people of, southern, of the southern kingdom Judah are on the brink of forceful removal from the promised land. No longer are they sitting on the edge of the promised man land looking in. They are now in the promised land being forced out. If you remember one of my sermons from Isaiah before this Lenten season, you might remember that after King Solomon, the Israelite kingdom splits in two, with the northern kingdom coming out of the ten tribes that have joined together, and they make their place of government. They put their king in the city of Samaria, while the southern kingdom of Judah maintains its location at Jerusalem, where the temple that Solomon built is already located. So 100 years earlier, in 722 BCE, before Jeremiah comes on the scene, the Assyrian Empire took the northern kingdom into exile. So all that is left now is Judah. Judah escaped the clutches of the Assyrians because the empire fell apart under the weight of rebellion by not only the Babylonians at the time, but other nations who rebelled against the Assyrians' kingship. And so the, the Assyrians have to retreat from how far they are from home and leave Judah as it is. And so Judah is spared for a time. 100 years later, now in the mid-620s BCE, Babylon has filled the void where the Assyrians left. And of course, as empires do, Babylon rampages across the Middle East. And this time, they're not going to leave Jerusalem as it is. The priest Jeremiah at the time, he starts as a priest, sees this all coming And the only reason he sees it coming is because he's not in the center of power in Jerusalem. This priest who becomes prophet serves the people of Israel at a little village four miles north of Jerusalem called Anathoth. So he is not a part of the elite priestly cult in the temple in Jerusalem. While the priests and prophets in Jerusalem are telling the people that all is well, God has continued to sustain us and hold us up. We have nothing to worry about, is what they tell them. Jeremiah becomes more and more aware over his 40 years of ministry that the religious elite are deeply mistaken. They don't see what's coming. Zionism has taken hold of the powerful in Jerusalem. They are convinced that God is backing them and won't allow them to fail. This should sound familiar. God is behind us. But Jeremiah, outside of Jerusalem's fortified walls, is listening and watching as the Babylonian Empire makes its way to Judah. In the tradition of the prophet and leader Moses, Jeremiah first resists God's call to speak to the covenant people, making excuses as Moses does, that I'm not fit for this calling. God does succeed, as God often does, convincing Jeremiah that he will be a prophet. And like Moses, his ministry will extend for 40 years but those 40 years are not easy. They're painful and disastrous as Jeremiah chronicles the tedious Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem 
which is finally completed in 587, but happens over the course of many years. Why does God allow this to happen to his covenant people, the ones that he had promised to be a kingdom forever? The people of Israel have strayed from God's covenant and worshipped other Canaanite deities. And they have struggled to give up these specific gods, Baal or Baal and Asherah. They have struggled with these gods since they came into the promised land. You'll read about these same gods in Joshua and Judges, and they just can't let them go. They have broken their commitment and relationship with the God who called them to this place, and now God is allowing them to be ripped from their inheritance as judgment for their betrayal and adultery. Jeremiah predicts this judgment and then watches it happen. Can you imagine seeing all of this take place, knowing that the leaders in charge are just letting it happen? This should sound familiar. In fact, some of Jeremiah's darkest moments occur when he is being ridiculed and alienated by the people of his village as well as the Jerusalem elite. Because guess what? They find out who he is when he walks into Jerusalem and begins prophesying the end of the kingdom. He calls out the false prophets in the king's court and the corrupted priests in the temple. This should sound like Jesus as well. Jesus in the tradition of Jeremiah. No one wants to hear Jeremiah's truth-telling, which leads Jeremiah to cry out to God in his suffering. Wondering, God, why won't you just release me from this call? Why do I have to watch this happen? Why do I have to watch as the Babylonians humiliate us and strip us of all that we have built for ourselves? Some of the most raw and authentic and, I mean, just painful Speaking to God happens in the book of Jeremiah as Jeremiah reflects on what he is watching, as he listens to what God is telling him, and no matter what he says, the very people who could change it all will not listen. But God won't let Jeremiah go, and God won't let his covenant people go either. Though the people may spit in his face and worship other gods, though the priests and prophets of Jerusalem may speak wrongly of God's will in way, taking God's name in vain, and though his mouthpiece, Jeremiah, may complain and call out God for what he is doing, God will not relent. So if you can imagine the setting that I describe above, Keep it in mind as we look at our text. The days are surely coming, says the Lord. Note who is speaking to whom in this text. God is speaking to the people of both the northern and southern kingdoms. Nobody gets left out. Even though the people may have split up and made two different kingdoms, that doesn't mean God has lost one of them or or does not feel the same love and commitment to both. Who is the one promising hope for the future? Not the people who are still unconvinced that anything is going to happen to them as they are. They're convinced that we are protected in God's city in Jerusalem. Nothing will touch us here. The Lord makes the promises. I will The central actor and instigator in this passage is not the adulterous people who have strayed from God's covenant and promises. The central actor is God. Count how many times the Lord is mentioned in this text. It's 15. As well as how many times the pronoun I is used in place of 
the Lord. God's promises and actions are not dependent on the people's arrogance, incompetence, ignorance, or sinfulness. God is going to act on behalf of his people out of his own integrity and commitment, no matter the brokenness and betrayal that the people have exhibited. In verse 32, like walking beside a little child and leading them by the hand, or like staying with an adulterous spouse when the truth is uncovered and the betrayal laid out for all to see, God does not give up on the people, even though looming destruction and death are on their doorstep. The days are surely coming, says the Lord. The people will go through this time in exile in Babylon, but God is not going to leave them there. God is not going to let them rot in Babylon. God has plans for the people as they grow through the experience. As they deal Right as they work through, in a lot of ways, the consequences of their sin. God does not prevent the suffering from happening, but he does promise that he will be there. He will be present. And one day, one day, God will lead them out of exile. But not until they have made it through what is to come. God will plant also law and relationship, not as a formal agreement anymore, but as the transformation of the core of every human's existence, the heart. No longer do I push these rules on you, but I will transform you from the inside out, God says. As much as we hate to say it, life isn't about rules It's about a change of heart. It's about growth. It's about becoming who we were meant to be as God's image bearers. God's steadfast love and commitment will accomplish this, not the people. The days are surely coming, says the Lord. Are you listening well this morning? Let's bring this to the present. The days are surely coming coming. The days are surely coming when things will return to normal, and we will no longer be exiled to our homes because of risk of getting sick or passing sickness on to others. The days are surely coming when we will bear fruit in keeping with the last year's experiences, fruit that gets at the core of who we are, what is deep and true about us as God's image bearers. The days are surely coming when we will eat together in our homes and in our churches, when our tables will be set for more than our immediate families. The days are surely coming when our vocabularies will not be so familiar with phrases like six feet apart or social distancing or mandatory masks or coronavirus. The days are surely coming when I won't have to have a mask policy in my office, when I won't have to turn around and go back home because I forgot my mask in my coat pocket. I know it's a personal problem. Are you listening this morning? The days are coming when we will drink coffee before church, when we will sing together. The days are surely coming. The here but not yet of this moment. The days are surely coming when we will hug and shake hands and embrace without a second thought as siblings in a family bound by the blood and sacrifice of Jesus. The days are surely coming when we realize that our Lenten themes define more than our faith that our Lenten themes define our very existence, relationship, commitment, wisdom, healing, and growth. The days are surely coming. And finally, the days are surely coming when the people of Hudertal Mennonite Church will sing and speak and hug and dance and wish and dream and play and work 
together as they once did and as they continue to do in the peace and love of Christ. Let us pray. God of growth and potential, give us hope for the days ahead of us. Hope in your promises. Help us walk and live into who you have created us to be. Empower us with your spirit to step out in faith, following your example and repenting of our unwillingness to change and grow. Enable our eyes to see the fruit that our lives are bearing in this community. The fruit that our lives are bearing in this world. Help us reflect on whether or not these fruits are those to be harvested for your kingdom. Thank you that the days are surely coming. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a reminder, we do have a uh, <clears throat> collection tray, offering tray in the foyer. And let's take a moment to bow in prayer for the offering. Lord, bless this offering as a sign of our allegiance to you. We proclaim you, Lord, over our lives, Lord, over our families, Lord, over our finances, Lord, over our future. We give you thanks for all you have given us and all we have the privilege to give. Use these gifts for the work of your church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
and cleanse me from my sin. O God, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in Sustain in me a willing spirit. Come wash me clean from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. O oh God, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew We will stand. Go into this week aware of the times of letting go that have allowed for new life to come. For only when a seed lets go does new life arise from it. This change in us happens not once, but many times over the course of our lives. Go aware of the deep growth stirring in you. Go in peace.